All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on how to scale your monitoring, uh, part one, Sensu clustering. Specifically, uh, we're going to cover the etcd clustering built into Sensu Go. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our my fellow presenter, Jeff Spoletta. Have at it, Jeff. Hey, everybody. So yeah, we were we're going to cover how to set up an initial uh, multi-node etcd cluster uh, for Sensu Go. The important thing here is that Originally, when Sensu Go was designed, uh, we decided to put etcd into Sensu Go as an embedded feature to really drop the bar for, for setting up your initial uh, Sensu Go backend. Uh, the previous generation product, uh, you always had to set up uh, additional technology, either it be Redis or Rabbit or both, so, uh, to handle the uh, event store and transport. And we decided that was a, that was actually a, a big hurdle for some of our users just to set up their initial uh, implementation. So by putting etcd into Sensu Go as an embedded option, it made it really easy to set up that initial backend using a single node etcd cluster. But to go beyond that and start uh, providing some scalability and high availability, you can actually run Sensu Go with a, uh, multiple backends in a etcd cluster configuration or use an external etcd cluster that's already set up in your infrastructure. Uh, in this webinar, I'm going to cover how to use the embedded etcd feature in Sensu Go, um, and that should helpfully um, or hopefully give everybody who's not used to using etcd enough information so they can then uh, go further and 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 build their own uh, high availability cluster, and and even using uh, external etcd as a replacement to the embedded. So in this webinar. Um, there are a few objectives I hope you learn uh, in this next half hour. First, uh, some very basic fundamentals for how etcd works and, and why we're using it. Um, also, uh, I'm going to walk you through a, the manual process of creating a Sensu Go uh, backend cluster. Um, this should be enough information you can then take it and then automate it with your automation tools of your choice. Um, I'm going to show you how you scale uh, the Sensu Go back in up and down. Also, um, some considerations to think about for backing up and restoring uh, a Sensu Go back in uh, uh, because we're now holding state in this uh, in Sensu Go. In the previous product, uh, state was defined in a set of uh, configuration files because we're actually using a storage solution in etcd here. Uh, you'll need a way to back up and restore in case something terrible goes wrong with your cluster. Um, we also, uh, at the very end, talk about some additional best practice to, you, to think about once you actually have a cluster up and running so you can get the most use out of it. So etcd fundamentals. So at its core, um, etcd is essentially uh, an algorithm uh, that provides the ability to get consistent state across uh, multiple nodes. It actually is a quorum algorithm. So the idea is that uh, more than 50% of the nodes need to have, need to agree on state and you have some available ability for some of them to fail out and come back and restore state. So for example, uh, a three member cluster uh, can tolerate uh, one failed member before it gets into, in, into an irreparable state that you have to take uh, additional action on. It's backed by a persistent on disk storage. So each node member has, has a record of um, its state uh, stored in a, in a database-like structure uh, on disk. Since you go, by default, we use an uh, embedded FTD for both configuration and event processing. So it's, it's uh, holding state for the configuration, but also uh, allowing us to implement uh, event pipelines and so that we can process them and handle them. Uh, by default, uh, since you go back in to act as both an etcd server and a client, but you can actually put since you go in a situation where it's only a client and it's talking to either uh, other uh, since you go backends um, etcd or an external etcd that you have in your infrastructure elsewhere. So the first part of trying to figure out all this is like getting your first real etcd uh, cluster up and running. Um, and, but to do that, you have to make some pre-flight choices uh, before you start. Uh, certain things have to be done or you've decided on before you build the cluster uh, and so that um, you don't uh, need to, to rebuild the cluster later. So uh, things to consider before you bootstrap your first uh, multi-node cluster, um, make sure you 
prepare your DNS uh, appropriately if you want to use uh, resolved host names instead of pure IP addresses for everything in the configuration. This is uh, something you'll need to consider. Um, for the demos here, I've prepped a host file uh, instead of dealing with a DNS server. Um, prepare um, any TLS assets and certs that you need if you want to use secure communications between the peers and clients in the um, etcd cluster. This way, <coughs> you can um, you can have your secure endpoints ready to go. This is probably the the most important thing to configure. If you you can't uh, easily switch between uh, insecure and secure or mix and match. So uh, for this demo, I'm not going to have secure endpoints. I'm going to, I'm trying to give you the basics here so that you can follow up on it. But we do have support for establishing secure connections and uh, for the Sensu Go uh, embedded cluster. And we'll provide some additional resources after this webinar that you can follow up on to extend what you've learned here and build a secure cluster. Uh, you also have to make sure that your firewall and security groups are set up correctly to allow the, the members to talk to each other. Make sure that you, on the nodes that you're converting into a multi-node cluster, you've stopped the backend service and you've actually purged the data store uh, because by default, uh, since you backend will start up in a single node cluster, um, the first time you run it, it'll actually populate an etcd data store for you. And that all has to be cleaned out before you reconfigure it into a multi-node cluster. Other things to consider when you're bootstrapping is you need to decide on your initial size of your cluster. Um, so that uh, you get the correct quorum you need uh, initially. I'm in my demo, I'm going to show you a three node cluster configuration, uh, which requires two nodes to be up before um, the cluster will be in a consistent state. Um, also make sure you, you name all of your Sensu backends with a unique etcd node name, but this is important from a etcd clustering standpoint. And I'll show you the examples in each of the configurations for the clusters or nodes I bring up. You also need to think about uh, setting an etcd token uh, that's cluster wide. This allows you to make sure that each of your clusters, uh, etcd clusters that might be in your in your network environment, um, have unique uh, specification. So let's get right into it. Uh, we are going to. Uh, I'm going to set up a three node cluster here. Um, so let me just show you where things are at right now. So I have uh, a set of EC2 instances. Each, uh, each one is going to be part of my C2 backend cluster. Um, and right now, let me show you. Since we backend shouldn't be running. Nope. And uh, let me show you. The data directory that I'm using for the back end is actually not populated yet. So um, this is an important pre-flight. I just want to make sure I showed you that I had, I had done that. Um, and, and it's something you should do too before you, you start trying to do a multi-node cluster bootstrap. So here is the back end YAML for the Sensu Go back end. I'm sure, or I hope everyone who's watching this has has run uh, at least at least played around with a single node cluster, so they're familiar with this backend YAML file. Um, what I've done here is I've taken the example that's packaged as part of the RPM package we provide, and I've reordered and uh, the config here and provided some commentary as comments to help understand what, what I've changed. So on the top is the default, um, there's the state directory um, where we're gonna hold the etcd state. Uh, that's the default. I've also turned on debugging here, that's just for me. But the important thing is the store configuration. This is the nit and gritty in how you set up the cluster. So, so initially, you, you each of the members needs to have a unique name. So I'm using uh, naming uh, syntax cluster 01 through 05. Um, the next thing you need to think about is making sure you provide the correct listening addresses for both peer connections and client connections in your etcd cluster. Uh, for me, because I'm expecting to do uh, external clients as part of this demo, I'm actually uh, telling it to bind on all interfaces for both clients and peers. Normally, uh, or I should say by default, uh, you would you would only really consider the, the local Sensu backend as, as a client. 
but because I'm expecting to scale this out with additional backend clients, I want to actually uh, bind to the outbound port as well. So in both cases, I'm binding to all interfaces and letting the underlying Linux system um, uh, bind to all of the ports. So the next thing you have to do is, and this is something you have to do on all the initial cluster members, they all have to agree on what the cluster is. So in this case, um, what you do is you set the etcd initial cluster as a string of cluster members, and it's a key value for each one. So the key is the name of the cluster member, uh, which is matches the etcd name uh, attribute in the config, and then the, the correct peer address. So for cluster one, I'm, I'm using its actual IP address inside the local only network and the, and the correct port in cluster two and cluster three. Uh, optionally, because I've set up my DNS, I should show you my host file next. Um, you can actually address these as DNS name. For the listen port, you can't because you have to bind to specific ports and they can't be DNS resolved. Um, but, for, but for these initial cluster addresses, you can actually use resolved host names here instead of the IP addresses. Uh, for most of what I'm going to show you, I'm going to use the IP addresses, but I do have one example where I use the cluster uh, DNS name. So um, a couple other things you have to make sure um, for each node is correct. So the advertised client URLs, these are the URLs that you're actually going to advertise as being available for client connections. So this is the IP address, uh, the outbound IP address for this node. I could optionally use the host name here too. This is what's going to be advertised to the rest of the cluster for where clients could be directed. Um, you also have the initial peer URL. This is the, this is what has to be uh, defined when you're bootstrapping a node as part of the, part of a new cluster, so that um, the peers know uh, which peer address to use. Um, and because it's a new cluster, the the etcd uh, configuration has an idea of state. It's either new or existing. And so when you're bootstrapping a new cluster, you want to make sure that each of the cluster members has new set here. But when we add a cluster member to an existing to existing cluster, uh, we'll be using a different setting here. And I'll show an example of that layer later. And the last thing is setting this cluster token. And like I said, this is more for to make sure that when you have multiple etcds in your topology, uh, you can keep track of each cluster as a separate thing. Uh, this is sort of this uh, unique name that you give it. So as I said, let me show you real quick. Here is what I've set up for my DNS for all of my, or my name resolution for all of my uh, clients in the in the system that I'm going to show you. So I've I've statically defined the the, the resolve names for each one, just to simplify the setup for this uh, webinar. So. That's what the first cluster member looks like. Uh, if I now, if I now start up the back end, it'll start. But what's interesting, what, what you can observe is that instead of starting up all of its uh, API endpoints, the back end has only started up its etcd client and etcd peer address. It hasn't started up its dashboard, API, or, or agent uh, endpoint yet because the cluster actually hasn't reached consensus. This is a this is a three-member cluster, so at least a, I need to have at least one more node up and running before I actually uh, generate uh, a working etcd cluster so I can actually init it or do any sort of uh, work with it. So here is the second member of that cluster. So let me show you real quickly. Very similar config. The only thing that really changes here is the specifics for this node. So it's going to be cluster 02. It's going to be the listen address is the same because I'm using the, uh, the bind to every port. But the advertise client address is now unique to this member. Um, and the advertise peer address is unique to this member. I'm using the IP addresses for cluster 2 and it's in the new state and it's the same token. So now, if I start since you back in, it's running and if I go back to the, to the other machine and if I look at what ports are now open, 
all the backend ports for the original machine for the first node on cluster 01 are up. So the dashboard is available, the API endpoints available, and the agent endpoints available. So I now have a working Sintu backend cluster again, but I still need to initialize it with an admin. So let me do that right now. Now I can actually can configure since you cuddle back in min. So so now with the since you cuddle uh, configured, I can actually check on cluster health. Since you cuddle provides uh, a command. Uh, under the cluster, a set of commands uh, to, to interact with the etcd cluster that's embedded. So the idea here is that you have just enough tools um, inside Sensu Cuddle to, to do basic operations with your embedded etcd without having to reach for the low level etcd uh, tools. Um, so then the basic one you wanna look at is just the cluster help. And this provides each cluster member has a unique ID from an etcd sense uh, the human readable name that you've given it, um, and the, the state. So this is a three member cluster. The first two I brought up, but I haven't brought up the third yet. And because, um, because of the way the consensus works, the quorum works, uh, this is a working cluster, even though it's partially in a degraded state. Uh, so I can actually now, um, whoops. Um, I can actually start the agent running on this machine and actually see that the agent's there in the entity list and, oops, I meant to do the event list. And it's keep alive is in the event list. So op operational cluster uh, now with some failover. Uh, so let me actually, for the oh, third- Before you do that, Jeff, uh, what, what do you actually have your agent pointed to in this case? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So by default, uh, without any reconfiguration, each agent is actually uh, pointing to um, server on localhost, right? But let's actually, let's actually, um, let's do a little YOLO here, right? So I'm gonna, let me, let me find the example in the packaging. So here's the example agent config. So let me copy this agent config into Oh, I have to do that. Hold on one second. So yeah, so by default, um, and the example configs always encode the defaults. Um, by default, it's it's actually talking to the backend URL that's just on localhost. But we can actually let's update that, right? We can actually give it a list of hosts. So I can actually give it um, cluster one local cluster two local. So now with this configuration, restart. And um, so now with that configuration, uh, I've actually pulled the agent to um, sort of take the first available backend it can connect to and establish a WebSocket connection to that. And if that fails, it'll fail over to the next, to the next available backend. So hopefully we'll actually, we'll actually see that in a minute when I fail a, um, when I, when I show you what it looks like to fail. So, so I just updated the, the Keep Alive event. Uh, you can see that Keep Alives are coming in, right? Here was one, they're about 20 seconds apart as per default Keep Alives. So let me actually now, 
spin up um, that last member of this of this uh, cluster so that we can get to a fully uh, high availability cluster that's not in, that is not in a degraded state. So, so just just for completeness, it's cluster O3. It's the same initial cluster string as the other two because it's the same cluster. Uh, but I'm using I'm using um, cluster three's uh, IP addresses here on the local network. So. So it's running now. If I do cluster help, we should see all three members of the cluster are there, right? So, so let's um, let me show you that it really is a cluster. So if I go to this, I go to another machine and I configure, and let's actually, yeah, let's let's use cluster zero three on this uh, sensu cuddle, right? So. And we'll do um, min now we do here we go. So since you cuddle is let me show you big so this sensu cuddle was actually talking to cluster O3, right? And this sensu cuddle is talking to local host, or in this case, uh, cluster O1, right? So it's definitely acting as a cluster. The sensu cuddle were talking to different machines. Uh, let me actually fail. Let me fail. Let me fail cluster zero one because cluster zero one was the first in the list of backends that the agent was talking to. So this. This should actually force the agent to bounce to a different uh, backend and that's listening in its config. So since you cuddle, whoops, sorry, not since you cuddle. So if I stop since you back in now, this since you cuddle will uh, no longer be working because it is failed, but the other one should still be there. And it still has an event. So, so if we wait a few seconds, and yep, you'll see that the other, the other, uh, the agent is still running. Has actually failed over to another cluster member, and it's a list of available cluster members in its config. So it's a functioning cluster. It's now actually, it's now actually in a in a slightly failed state. Um, so, but it's working. So let me actually bring that back up. So we have a fully involved uh, cluster again as a starting point. Here we go. So, so that's the basics for setting up a three node cluster. Um, but why I think we're going to go after that is obviously you have to be able to scale that. Right. You have to be able to uh, add an, an additional backend and remove a backend uh, from service. Because if you just stop the server, right, um, it's still, from an NCD standpoint, it's part of the quorum. But when you want to decommission a server, you have to, you have to stop that. So, so let, let me go over what that looks like now. So, so let's say I want to decommission um, server three, right? Uh, and I want to remove it out of the cluster and replace it with a, a different server. So the so the what I would do is I would add the initial the add that extra server first. So from Sensu Cuddle's point of view, uh, because we have the ability to do some cluster manipulation, we can actually do member add uh, and and prep the cluster to to, to accept another member into the uh, quorum, right? So. Member add requires a name, so let's do cluster zero four, and it and it requires uh, a peer address to expect. So in this case, I'm going to do I'm going to use the DNS name instead of the IP address that I've prepared, and twenty three eighty no twenty three eighty. So now I've added a cluster member, and 
And hopefully, Sensu Code will actually spit back some useful environment settings that you can use in automation when actually scaling things up. What you're seeing here is the necessary environment variables that you would need if you're going to start um, Sensu backend. Instead of using the config file, you can set uh, the exact same configurations as part of an environment. So you can actually use this command, grab the necessary environment variable changes, and then use them in the environment that uh, your new backend will need. So in this case, um, it tells you that you, you need to name that cluster member 04, right? Um, here is the new cluster string that includes all four cluster members. Um, and here is that state string, which now existing instead of new. So once you set those three strings and you start uh, since you backend, the uh, since you backend knows, hey, I want to attach this cluster in an existing state, and I'm cluster zero four in terms of the node number, node name. So everything you need to do there is provided when you, in the output of that command, so you can automate this. But I'm going to do this manually. So let me show you what I have set up again. So here's what I've prepped for this uh, new cluster member in terms of store configuration. Cluster 04, that's, re that's the required change. And instead of, instead of using um, the IP addresses this time, I'm using all the members, I'm using the, the resolved host name that I have in the host file. So cluster01.local and so on. So, and those are equivalent to the IP addresses once they resolve. And so here's an example. And for the advertised URL, I'm using the resolved host name for cluster four instead of the IP address. So I just want to show you that that you can use both the DNS names uh, and the IP addresses um, sort of interchangeably um, for for these as for these aspects. You can't do it for the listens. Um, so let me well let me show you real quick before I do that. Now that I've added that member, it's actually come up in a in a failed state, right? Because from an etcd cluster standpoint, there are now four members. It's just that that fourth member hasn't contacted them yet with that cluster. So, so we're sort of in a degraded state. Uh, we still have quorum because uh, two is the uh, three is the required quorum uh, for a four-member cluster. So let me. It started now. If I go into health, all four cluster members are up and available. So, and as I said, um, so it, because the quorum state is such that more than 50% need to be available, um, I can only still fail one cluster if I wanted to uh, fail one cluster member. If I wanted to get to a uh, higher availability uh, uh, tolerance and get to two, I need to have a five cluster here. So, that is an example of adding a cluster member. Uh, removing a cluster member is actually pretty, pretty easy. So here I'm on cluster two. What I'm going to do first is system. Whoops, sudo. I'm going to stop the backend. Right. So now my health should be in a degraded state. And now to remove the member. Um, let's go back. Just look at there is a there is a member remove command. So member remove, and this requires the etcd ID, not the uh, not the human name for the node, but the ID as as defined. So let me go back to cluster health, and that's reported in cluster health output. Here's the ID. So if I do member remove ID. We've now told the FTD cluster, please remove this node out of out of the out of the set of members so that it's not participating in the quorum calculation anymore. So now we're back to a three member cluster, uh, not in a degraded state, all three members are healthy. So that's an example of, of how you actually take uh, an existing member out of the cluster and then uh, replace it with an additional one because now I have clusters here one three and four. So um, I did it manually, but but these steps can easily be automated in any sort of any sort of config management that you want to do. So I think so the last thing I want to show is how you can actually scale your event processing by adding Sensu backend as a etcd client, not as an etcd um, 
node member. So uh, adding an NCC node member provides um, high availability, but it comes at a trade-off, right? Because you're doing more network um, access, more network uh, data load uh, to form that consensus. So as you add additional etcd members, uh, you're putting more load on the system, right? If you add this into backend client, you're just doing the necessary bits to pull information out of that etcd cluster and do uh, useful work. So it's a it's a trade-off. Uh, uh, you can actually extend event processing without complicating the the high availability uh, tolerance. So let me show you. I've prepped uh, one more system. Whoops. Um, to be a client. And I should note all of this that I'm going through now manually for you is actually in, is part of our documents. We actually have a guide for clustering. We'll add that as a resource uh, to the webinar at the uh, once we publish this. But uh, but all of this is covered. So if, if you are rather a reader than a, a video viewer, you can well you'll be able to look at this closely uh, following the documentation that we provide too. So so let me show you the back end again. Here the, the store configuration is much reduced because we don't have to actually set up anything associated with etcd peering as a member. Uh, we're telling this back end that we don't want to use the embedded etcd and instead I want to actually access an existing uh, cluster using these client URLs. So in, in this demo I'm actually using the uh, embedded etcd I just created but this is the exact same process that you would do if you wanted to take a Sensu backend and use an etcd store that you have somewhere else in your infrastructure instead of the one provided by the embedded um, Sensu Go implementation. So what we do now is uh, sudo start So now I have uh, a client running, right? Um, let me show you that it's not part of, we still only have a three node member. So how do I really know that this Sensu backend is running? Um, well, first, I can show you what ports are it's listening on. So in this case, um, it's still putting its uh, dashboard UI up. It still has its API endpoint up. And it still has its um, it still has its agent endpoint up. So if I I can actually send to configure again and let me I'm sorry I meant cluster of it's cluster of five. Oh, I knew I was going to fat finger the password at some point. It's not a live demo unless you do that, right? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you another way. I'm gonna show you that it's working another way. I might not have actually opened up the. Uh, the security group for that. But instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run an agent locally on this machine that is configured initially with the default, which is um, just to talk to the back end on the local host. So if I do I now have the Sentu backend client uh, agent running, which is uh, this machine right here. In fact, I can actually show you. Um, now, if I if I actually stop this backend now, um, we should actually. If I delete this, it won't come back up even though 
it's running. In fact, this should maybe come up right now. Yeah, so let me show you, let me show you the status of the service. Yeah, so because the, because the local backend uh, isn't running, uh, the agent on this machine is having trouble uh, communicating, right? It can't find its configured backend that it's trying to talk to. So, but if I, if I restart this backend, the agent comes right back up. Yeah, so here's an example of having an agent talk to a Sentu backend that's just running as a, as a client to the FTD cluster instead of being a cluster member. So that's a way you can actually scale up um, your event processing by, without, without uh, adding additional overhead to your FTD cluster configuration. So I think, yep, I've done those two demos. Uh, I guess the next, next topic is, what do you do about backing up your cluster? Um, because um, since you go uses um, a staple configuration instead of file system. Uh, the previous generation of Sensu uh, configuration was set as a, a set of files in the system, which has uh, pros and cons and, and moving towards more of a containerized uh, workload going into a shared state uh, situation with etcd makes a lot of sense and simplifies things greatly because there's only one source of truth. But at the same time, you want to make sure you have some disaster preparedness and you can back up that state and then recover it if you have to, if you have to uh, rebuild your cluster from scratch. So what we have available now in Sensu Cuddle is um, a dump command that can be used to dump uh, part of your configuration, uh, say a specific namespace, or everything that you have in your uh, Sensu uh, Cuddle resources uh, defined. So let me show you real quick. Uh, if I do dump all namespaces, all, um, just it, it outputs a YAML by default. And so you can actually save this to a file and then re-inject it using Sensu Cuddle create. Uh, one thing. What about users, um, Jeff? Oh yeah. So. Let me show, yeah, I just wanna show you real quick. That's a good question. I just wanna show you real quick that I, the dump command also provides a list of all the, all the resource types that it currently supports. So you can actually uh, check and make sure that you, if you wanted to uh, just dump specific things, you can, you have access to basically everything that the API has in terms of a resource type in your existing Sensu Cuddle. But the question about users, it's, um, let me show you. So here's the dump of the user. And, and one thing to note is that the user dump doesn't include passwords. Uh, this actually is a, a security feature uh, and not a, um, not a bug. Uh, because we wanna make sure that, that when you're, you're able to dump the configuration in a way that doesn't leak uh, sensitive information, um, user passwords are not dumped. And then and uh, we actually advise you to, use the Sensu uh, ability to work with a SSO provider. So you can actually authenticate against a separate SSO so that you're not actually keeping passwords in Sensu. Uh, this way um, you can do a complete backup of your state without leaking information. Uh, there's also uh, the same holds for, uh, for secrets. It's, it's really great if you use an external secrets provider so that um, you can keep you can keep all of your monitoring information sort of in a public repo from so that your team can work on it without having to be concerned about leaking um, sensitive information. So I think that is what I wanted to cover there. Uh, I should say I should say that you you always have access to the etcd native snapshotting. Um, um, I didn't want to cover that in this demo. Uh, we'll have we'll have some resources. Uh, for you to pointing to the etcd documentation, but etcd itself has an ability to snapshot the database and restore. Uh, but I wanted to cover the, the higher level Sensu tools so that you can get information out uh, without having to know uh, deep details on, on working with etcd natively. So I think um, that is the all the demos I wanted to cover. I'll, and for the next couple of minutes, I think it's important to cover
uh, sort of next steps on uh, Sensu practices you should think about uh, once you're working with uh, one of the clusters um, be going beyond uh, a simple single backend. Um, one thing to definitely think, keep in mind is that when you start working with multiple cluster members because they're communicating over, over a network, you want to keep those members uh, together locally. If you need to uh, extend Sensu across multiple data centers or availability zones um, or across multiple clouds, right? Uh, you want you can actually use Sensu's uh, federation ability to connect all of those individual Sensu clusters together, uh, so you can you can work uh, with the monitoring configurations um, with a single login that way. Um, you also want to think about when you start working with Sensu uh, in a containerized environment. Uh, think about using persistent volume stores uh, associated with your. Uh, since you backend definitions or staple sets, that way, that way um, you can bring up uh, members quickly without having to uh, rebuild uh, your data store um, by just reusing that that persistent volume. So you can you can really add some flexibility to how you scale because that way you can just pull members in and out of that cluster for from a high availability standpoint. Uh, and then let etcd's quorum uh, bring it back up to current state when you when you add it back um, definitely look at using load balancers for the agent and api client connections uh, we talked a little bit from questions todd gave me um, the agent by default always tries to talk to the local host uh, but then adding additional hosts you end up making an array uh, you really simplify your agent configuration if you use a uh, load balancer like Nginx because Nginx is, does actually handle the WebSocket connections for load balancing. So you can actually push that complexity into your load balancer instead of your, instead of your agent configuration. So you can, literally, you can now just have an agent configuration that points to a single address and let the load balancer do what it's good at. Um, and the same goes for the uh, Sensu Cuddle connections, right? Sensu Cuddle can only connect to a single uh, URL, make that the load balancer, and that way you don't have to worry about having Sensu Cuddle fall over because you've connected to a backend that's disappeared. You can let your load balancer redirect that for you. Um, always use an odd number of uh, cluster members so you get the most value from a high availability standpoint. The remember cluster has the ability to fail one member, a five member cluster has availability to fail two. Um, you probably don't want to think about going beyond, uh, say, seven because of the amount of complexity in terms of uh, amount of network interaction to keep those seven in state is going to become uh, an overhead. Um, instead, think about uh, using backend clients uh, to extend your event processing. Uh, and as I said, uh, think about using secrets and external secrets and SSO providers to simplify what you're storing in your in the sensor monitoring so that it makes up your backup or restore uh, easier and less prone to leak uh, sensitive information. And we can, and talking about um, scaling events, once you get past what you can scale by just uh, scaling sideways with uh, sensor backend clients, um, you can actually take the event processing out of that CD entirely and move it into a Postgres event store with, uh, with an advanced feature um, it's a little more complicated, but the but the gets you sort of an order of magnitude plus more event processing capability without having to have a large set of federated clusters. So um, we actually have a blog post from uh, our CTO about that. All of the engineering work that went into um, doing some performance tuning on how to build um, or maximize event throughput. It's uh, and we'll put that blog post as a as an additional resource. Uh, when we post this webinar. So I think I think that's basically everything I wanted to cover. Uh, hopefully this helps people who uh, who have sort of some fits and starts trying to get the back end um, in a multi-node uh, situation. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for viewing uh, <laughs> uh, this, this webinar. Uh, we're going to definitely do some more along the series. There's, there's a lot more, as I talked about, um, Setting up a TLS is a whole other topic that deserves its own 30 minutes to an hour. So uh, watch out for more about uh, scaling and uh, security features. Um, so uh, thanks again.
All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for all that content. And thanks for everybody for watching.